Good afternoon. My name is Olivia with Town Hall Seattle, and on behalf of the staff at Town Hall, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Jane McGonigal and Margaret Morris. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of their, the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are so glad you have joined us today. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps slash McGonagall or scan the QR code right now on your screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat as well and you can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible and you can help, your, help us by keeping your own question concise. Also a reminder that if you'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Next week, Elena Konis and Sally James uh, join us to discuss the rise, fall, and toxic return of DDT. And if you're passionate about other forward-thinking science topics, don't miss the upcoming UW Engage Science Series, featuring five nights of talks that highlight the work of students at the forefront of scientific research in our region. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as events are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of, as part of our Arno G. Matulski Science Series, this event is supported by Microsoft. Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members who are joining us. If you share in Town Hall's goal of a community energized and empowered by considering questions of politics, science, and culture, please consider supporting us by becoming a member. You'll find membership information on our website. Lastly, you'll absolute, absolutely want to dig into today's topic by purchasing your own copy of the author's book. Use the link in the chat below to get a copy directly through the publisher. Jane McGonigal, PhD, is a future forecaster and a designer of games created to improve real lives and solve real problems. She is the author of two New York Times bestselling books, Reality is Broken and Super Better, and her TED Talks on how gaming can make a better world have more than 15 million views. She was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, one of Fast Company's top 100 creative people in business, and one of the top 35 innovators changing the world through technology by MIT Technology Review. She is the Director of Games Research and Development at the Institute for the Future, a nonprofit research group in Palo Alto, California. Margaret Morris, PhD, is a clinical psychologist focused on how technology can support well-being. She is an affiliate faculty member in the Information School at the University of Washington and a research consultant. Morris is the author of Left to Our Own Devices, Outsmarting Smart Technology to Reclaim Our Relationships, Health, and Focus. McGonagall's new book, Imaginable, is the subject of today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Morris and Jane McGonagall. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, Jane, it's such an honor to get to talk with you. I've been uh, following your work since Super Better. Mm. And, um, you know, it's really, really interesting to read more about the whole history of your forecasting and game design um, in Imaginable. So thank you for visiting with us in Seattle tonight. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could walk us back to, I think it was around 2010, when you led the forecasting simulation or exercise um, called Superstruck that you know, sort of had this uncanny forecasting of what we've all been going through the last couple of years. Yeah, sure. So as you said, I... Um or I think in the introduction, it was explained. I'm the director of game research and development at the Institute for the Future. My job is to create immersive experiences that help people imagine hard to imagine future events, things that are hard to imagine because we've never lived through them. We have no direct experience of them. Maybe humanity has never lived through them. And also things that are you know, hard to imagine, hard to think about because they might be uncomfortable to think about. I, I do specialize in looking ahead to disruption, maybe risks or global threats to help people 
feel like they have a better understanding of what we might need to prepare for and maybe start to think about actions that we all can take today to make a better future, maybe change the future that we wind up in. So back in 2008, actually, I started creating this new genre of game called social simulations, which are an effort to anticipate how different crises or disruptions might play out by inviting thousands of people to come together and game out the future. And we call them social simulations because it's not like the kind of computer simulation where a programmer puts in a bunch of algorithms and you just press go and the computer does all of the imagining for you and spits out a bunch of you know, facts. Um, in, in social simulations, we use people's natural intelligence about their own needs, their own likely behaviors, and we collect that and analyze it for trends. So back in 2008, the first big game that we ran like this at the Institute for the Future was called Superstruct. And it centered around a global respiratory pandemic that started in the year 2019. So we just like to look at least 10 years out in the future. So way back in 2008, we had this respiratory distress syndrome and we asked people to spend six weeks with us imagining how they would adapt to this kind of pandemic. Um, so for example, we would ask them, imagine that you've been told to quarantine for two weeks, you've been exposed to the virus. Under what circumstances would you violate this order? Why, why are you going out anyway, if at all, if you would? And uh, the number one answer that we got from our participants, we had more than 8,000 people spend six weeks imagining their lives in this fictional pandemic. The number one answer was for religious worship, right? Which was surprising to us at the time, but going to church, to synagogue, to these, these um, spiritual communities was so central to people's sense of purpose and meaning that they would go even in the middle of a pandemic. Um, now, fast forward, of course, to the real 2019 leading to 2020, we saw that churches and religious gatherings were the super spreading event. It was the most likely place for people to go, even though they tested positive, where we saw a lot of the early outbreaks stemming from. We had all kinds of data like this from our participants, um, which made me in 2020 and 2021, um, realizing how accurate ordinary people had been and, and how able they had been to anticipate social consequences that experts, public health experts, epidemiologists had not predicted, made me want to kind of dig in, think about what made these so accurate as forecasting devices, but also to follow up with participants to see if having imagined living through a pandemic actually changed their experience of it. And, you know, I know in, in your area of work, this is probably something that was of interest to you. People did report feeling less anxiety, less dread, less uh, powerlessness, um, and were reported being able to just accept the reality faster and kind of roll up their sleeves and get on with dealing with the facts of this new normal. And, and to me, that was an interesting unexpected side effect that makes me, you know, even more curious to think about how we might use social simulations and playing with future scenarios to build a kind of emotional and mental resilience for, mm -hmm. for disruptions or crises that we might need to live through in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's just, it's, it was amazing reading about how, how similar the forecasting was to what happened. Um, and how difficult well, it was in 2020 to even give people helpful advice based on what you had learned, because the resistance was still so strong. Um, and I think for me, and probably for many people, one of the few comforts available in the pan, you know, as a result of COVID is that we're mentally better prepared for the next pandemic, um, that it won't seem so out of this world. And you've written quite a bit about what the next pandemic might be like. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Um, now I will say, um, so I'm a game designer and I create games that help us face the future with more creativity and optimism. But in order to get those benefits, 
you really have to play the games. I always say like the analogy is uh, a chef makes a beautiful meal. You're starving. You can't just look at the food on the plate. You have to eat it. Right. So I'll talk about the, um, the, the next scenario we've designed the next social simulation that we've designed at the Institute for the future. We actually just started running it a couple of weeks ago. It is about the next pandemic, but I want to make sure people know it might sound a little bit hard to think about <laughs> and not something you want to imagine, but when you actually start playing, I'm amazed, you know, there are lots of scenarios in imaginable and um, some of them are about great, amazing futures. And some of them are about mm, challenging, but, but maybe that would lead to positive change. And some of them are kind of a little bit mm, scary to think about. And I thought this next pandemic scenario, people might be like a little bit squeamish about because who wants to imagine another pandemic after we're still, you know, living through this one. Um, but almost everybody says it's their favorite scenario in the book, which is very interesting. And, and, you know, me, I'm like, I'm interested in psychology. Why, why do people say and feel surprising things? What I'm starting to understand from talking to people is that we actually at a very deep visceral level want to believe that we can do better next time. Exactly as you just said, we want to feel like the world will make better decisions. Our communities will make better decisions. Our leaders will, we will personally make better decisions. And so a simulation of, of, of the future pandemic can be a chance to, to get some of that healing and some of that hope kind of locked in um, by actually practicing or imagining what we might do, we can actually feel like, yeah, we really, we have it this time, we're gonna do better. So I think that's why people like it. Um, this, this scenario, it's called the alpha gal crisis. And it's about what could potentially be the first tick-borne pandemic. So not a virus, not something that's contagious from person to person, but something that's uh, spread through tick bites. And this is on our radar at the Institute because you know, we base our forecasts, our scenarios on signals of change. We look at what's already happening today, not hypothetical ideas, not sort of wild fictional ideas, but real things that are happening today. And we try to understand when do these signals of change sort of pick up intensity? They're becoming bigger signals, amplified, really look like powerful drivers of change. And one of these big drivers of change is the growing number of people who, if you do like a random blood draw of people on the street, in some parts of the United States, more than a third of people have already um, apparently been bitten by a tick that can sensitize them to a sugar molecule called alpha-gal. So the tick picks it up from animals. Some of it gets kind of mixed with your blood during the tick bite, and it creates severe, often anaphylactic reactions to meat, mammalian animal products like gelatin, which surprisingly is in things like uh, toothpaste and toilet paper. It's not just, you know, we're not just talking about burgers. And, you know, if a third of people in, in the South uh, Eastern US have already been sensitized, you know, another couple bites, or if they keep eating a lot of meat, their body's going to keep becoming sensitized, overreact, have these allergic reactions. Um, you know, it's worth thinking about how we would adapt as a society in our cultural practices. If we suddenly had um, a major problem with people, it, that there would be dangerous for people to be in contact with mammalian animal products. And um, it would be a different, it would be a different thing. It's not contagious person to person, but what I'm inviting people to do is to imagine, you know, how would you help in this scenario? How would you adapt your own behaviors? How would schools be different? How would workplaces be different? How would sporting events and the 4th of July and birthday parties and all that? And we start to imagine changes we might have to make so that just like when we lived through the COVID-19 pandemic and suddenly we were doing everything differently in ways that we had never imagined, it was kind of hard to for many people to lean into the change or accept that the change needed to happen. If we can, if we can spend a little time imagining it now, you know, a few minutes, a few days. Um, if we do need to change, uh, my, my experience running these games suggests we would be able to react faster, adapt faster and help others and ourselves more effectively. 
Yeah, I mean, some of the ideas in the book are, are super funny, right? Like people who are going to design cool ways to tuck your jeans into your socks or- Oh yeah, we're going to need fashion influencers who are pulling the socks way up over your pants. Like it wasn't cool when Steve Urkel did it, but it's cool in this future because it's going to prevent us from getting tick bites, right? And, or EpiPen holsters. And, mm. and then, um, but what do you think, I mean, and it, but it's, it's tricky to think about how you can really be helpful. I think in, in COVID, there was this big shift to doing things outside, the safer than doing those same things inside, right? And, but in a tick-borne illness, as you point out, like being outside is dangerous because that's where the ticks are. And um, so it's, you know, the lessons learned are, don't apply, you know, it's not a copy and paste, obviously. And so mm-hmm. in terms of how you can be, what do you think people can do to be helpful? You talk a lot about knowing what you're packing for the future, knowing what skills you have. Can you say something about that? Yeah. I mean, so just in terms of thinking, what could we do better, even though it's different than a contagious virus, one thing we can do better is we could inform ourselves now about what alpha gal syndrome is, how it works, how what the symptoms are, so that if it does start to you know happen in our in our communities, we just notice it faster, right? These ticks may, you know, the population may be blooming and more people are getting sick, we could notice it faster. And and so that's just, you know, if more people understand who knew about coronaviruses before this pandemic, this is not like a common knowledge topic for most people, how coronaviruses work. So yeah, well, you know, let's learn about alpha gal syndrome. We can be more better informed. I think a big issue we had with this pandemic was lack of empathy for people who were affected differently, you know, um, in the case of COVID-19, it was older people, people with underlying conditions. And I think a lot of people took that as permission to not take it seriously for themselves if they didn't feel like they were personally at higher risk. Um, You know, that category also included frontline workers, right? People who were exposed more often. In this scenario, um, you know, could we imagine having more empathy for people who have the sensitivity or who have developed the full-blown syndrome and what would we do to make make things safer for them i mean one of the most surprising things that i learned from the alpha gal syndrome community people who are already living with it is that even just smelling meat can trigger an anaphylactic mm-hmm. reaction in people with this sensitivity and they use the term airborne meat which I mean, so in a way we've, we have been talking quite a lot about, you know, what is airborne and safe um, air and ventilation and air filtering. Well, I mean, just literally grilling a burger in your backyard could be um, incredibly dangerous for somebody who just even smells the meat. I mean, th- these things are not you know, like I said, it doesn't sound like it would be fun to imagine, but the way you actually participate in these social simulations is you just keep a diary for 10 days. And as you go through your daily life, you're sort of bringing this scenario around with you in your, in your mind and your imagination. So if you go to a coffee shop, you're imagining how, how would this coffee shop be different? What are people doing differently? What are they wearing differently? What are they talking about? What signs are on the bulletin board? Something you might see in this future that you don't see today and come home and like write, you write about it in this journal from the future. Or if you're, you know, throwing a birthday party, you're going to Disneyland, you're at a little league game, you're working, um, you're working on a new policy, you know, idea in your firm, like whatever you're doing, you're, you're coming back to this future scenario and you're just trying to sort of figure out if I had to do that in a tick-borne pandemic, what might be different? What would I encounter? What would I feel? What would I see in here? And this creates a real, really vivid experience of the future. It's almost like you're becoming a science fiction writer. You know, you're the next Octavia Butler or Margaret Atwood or Neil Stevenson, right? You're telling these really rich, vivid, imaginative stories using the scenario to inspire you to imagine something, you know, that no one's lived through yet. And then we collect these stories and we share them and we respond and, and all the diary entries lead up to, as you said, you thinking about what you would do, you know, maybe you're a fashion influencer on Instagram. So you start making it cool um, or you're an entrepreneur and you invent these really sexy holsters for EpiPens so people can, you know, help others who are having allergic reactions. Um, 
or, uh, you know, you're, you're going to learn how to cook your family's favorite meals in a plant-based version, you know, so that you can continue your family traditions, but maybe in a way that's safer for all, whatever you might do, you connect the things you love, you connect your skills and passions. And what we see is people come out of these simulations fired up to do something. And, and oftentimes it doesn't stay in the simulation, right? They'll actually, you know what, that's a great business idea. I don't have to wait for a future crisis to try this. Um, or, you know, that's a skill I could learn, or, you know what, like I'm imagining myself in this future, you know, taking, taking on this kind of leadership role. Maybe I should try to explore that today. So in a way, the actual future scenario, it doesn't matter as much as the fact that the future gives us permission to imagine ourselves doing things that we might not allow ourselves, gives ourselves permission, you know, to do today. So there's, there's, a, again, there's all these like interesting psychological side effects, you know, unexpected benefits that come from taking these mental time trips to the future. Yeah. As you're describing this mental um, time travel it's really interesting to see how you, I don't know if it's kind of running in parallel or building on um, concepts from psychology, like um, episodic future thinking and future selves. And, you know, what's, what's fascinating is how in your work, you know, you apply these, well, again, I, I don't want to I'm not sure if, if you invented them or if they, you know, these things developed in parallel, but like you're working at the societal level, whereas the psychologists and neuroscientists and social scientists who were social psychologists who were working with EFT and future selves are working at the level of the, really the ind individual, how the individual sees their future self or, you know, how they, what their brain, what areas of the brain light up, right? When they're thinking about a future event and how that ties in to their mood and stuff. So um, I don't know, was that, how did that all happen? Are mm. these just movements that are like coexist or? What a, what a cool yeah. question. Yeah, let me, let me tell you some stories <laughs> about, yeah. about how these fields have evolved together. So I started working at the Institute for the Future when I was coming out of doing my, my graduate work on what kinds of games might we create to allow gamers to apply their gaming skills to real world problems. And I started collaborating with the Institute for the Future, working with the theory that, you know, gamers are really good at thinking sort of multiple moves ahead and anticipating the consequences of consequences of consequences. And so we thought, you know, maybe bringing gamers together to game out a future scenario would be a really good use of their creativity and their strategy. So I started developing these games and we were really trying to create, you know, essentially collective intelligence about what might happen. At the same time, over the past, I would say, you know, 10, 15 years, there has been a growing interest in, in futures thinking, what happens in the brain when we try to imagine the future and the possible uses of future imagination in positive psychology to help people imagine their best future selves or the world that they want to wake up in, and also to treat symptoms of depression and anxiety by giving people techniques to control their imagination. So instead of ruminating on things in the past that have upset us, as we often do with depression, that we are controlling our imagination to think about possible futures that would motivate us to take action today with anxiety instead of anxiety is very future focused, but we kind of lose control of what's in our imagination. We get stuck on these really anxiety provoking scenarios and details. We can train the imagination to focus on being effective in the future, which, you know, I didn't realize this is exactly what we were doing at the Institute mm -hmm. with our future scenarios. Like imagine this somewhat scary future, but hey, you're powerful in this future. You're important. You're helping. What are you doing? Um, so giving people specific strategies to be able to think about the things that are hard to think about, mm -hmm. but in a way that feels like it's building our mental preparedness, our emotional resilience. So all of this was happening, you know, in the field of psychology and, um, when I was reading the literature and I started attending conferences, I realized there was something missing from all of the interventions that were being designed and all of the, the strategies for increasing future imagination capacity um, that 
there was no like future in these interventions. They would say, <laughs> imagine yourself, you know, walking on the beach 10 years from now, or imagine yourself meeting a friend uh, for dinner 10 years from now. But how do you imagine the future without some information, right, about how the future might be different, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what social movements might have changed society, what new technologies might be a part of everyday life, what crises, you know, we might be living through. Mm -hmm. um, so I got really interested in trying to combine these two practices, you know, future forecasting and strategic foresight, which is trying to anticipate what the world might be like, society might be going through, and then these individual psychological practices that were, you know, starting to be validated to help with things like depression and anxiety, and also to recover future thinking capacity after traumatic brain injury. I mean, this all, it all seemed really interesting, but I just thought there, these two things would work better together. If, if people should be trained to think about the imagination, they need some information about the future. And also, as we're trying to help people think about hard to imagine futures, we could use some of the psychology to make it a safer space to imagine and a more, mm -hmm. you know, psychologically supportive and restorative experience, um, which, so it's just been great to try to weave these two fields together. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like in psychology, there's been, you know, kind of excitement about future thinking as sort of having this sort of trans, um, trans diagnostic promise, right? So like, you don't have, it doesn't really matter so much like which subtype of depression someone has, or like, I mean, it, there's for mo for many different people thinking about the future in a guided way may, may be helpful. And um, so, so that's, you know, super exciting. I think, you know, in some of that research, there's the use of, I, I think, you know, you pointed out in the beginning that what you do is this like social forecasting, um, and social scenario building. Whereas I think some, some of that research has used like VR to represent the future or sort of like avatars of individuals, what they might look like in the future, the, the future self work. And I wondered you know, um, in this moment of <laughs> renewed excitement about uh, virtual reality and stuff, if that's part of how you're working at all, or is, it, is most of your stuff built on the tradition of body storming and, and yes. conversation? Yeah. So I should channel my colleague, Toshi Hu, who leads our mm -hmm. emerging media laboratory at the Institute for the Future. There are folks at the Institute who are very excited about using virtual reality to help people imagine hard to imagine futures, right? Like kind of take a little bit of that cognitive lift off of people and really show them the world they might be in. So there is a lot of interest in that. Um, one of the big projects coming out of the Institute's Emerging Media Lab this year is a project to work with individuals who are about to re-enter a society after a period of incarceration and working with them to design simulations within VR of situations they might encounter in their everyday lives mm -hmm. once they're back in society. Um, that might pose uh, a challenge to them and, and potentially a future risk or threat of recommitting, reoffending, and returning mm -hmm. to prison. So this is um, part of a larger strategy to help people avoid reoffending. Right? We re-enter society, we stay there, we're happy, we're productive, mm -hmm. um, we leave prison behind. And um, so my colleagues at the institute have been working with individuals who are recently re-entered or about to re-enter to think about these um, scenarios and then give them this chance to really vividly experience being in these situations so that they can pre-feel the feelings, they can think through the strategies. And what's really interesting about this project is, you know, when I design a future simulation, I almost always put it at least 10 years in the future because, uh, it creates a sort of psychological safe space, you know, hey, I'm not telling you to worry about this tomorrow, you know, it's like a decade from now. So it's, it feels a little bit more comfortable. It's, it feels a little bit more like play rather than a serious uh, situation we have to deal with now. And also because 10 years out, um, most people are willing to consider that things will be different. It's a long enough timeline that they don't get into arguments. Well, that doesn't sound like that could ever happen or I don't know. I mean, they sort of are more accepting of, <laughs> the new of new normals when you're talking about 10 years out but in this project 
you know, the future that is radically different may only be a few days or weeks away. And so I think that's also, it's just, it was sort of a profound realization, right? That um, the future happens at different different rates for people, depending on our, our context, our situation, the changes that we might be confronting. Um, and so it's kind of interesting for me to file away and, and think about, um, you know, could we even use these far future imagination techniques for near future decisions yeah. or experiences? Yeah. And so, so it sounds like you're still, still thinking still thinking about that, like for something like, how am I going to cope with something that's likely to happen next week? Um, right. Versus, yeah. yeah, I mean, and it could, I mean, it's interesting, like, so one of my favorite strategies that I took from the research literature on clinical interventions that were designed to restore future imagination mm -hmm. capacity. And these are with people with traumatic brain injury or Parkinson's or aging related cognitive decline who were having incredible difficulty literally picturing the future, envisioning the future. It, it was like blank, right? Um, this is sort of new disability where they could not in any detailed way describe well, what are you going to be doing this weekend or imagine that you're going shopping later today like what are you can you picture what are you buying what do you need to bring with you there's really uh, just practical difficulty of imagining anything in the future um so the the strategy that researchers developed and proved very effective was something called specificity training or specificity induction where they lead people through imagination exercises and it could be about a past event or just a imaginary event. Like imagine you're, you're arriving at a circus and you, you know, describe what you see, what you hear, what you feel, mm -hmm. what, um, taste, you know, what you smell, um, who are you with, what emotions are coming up. And they, they get people to tell these detailed, detailed stories. And there's something about practicing specificity of imagination and it can be about a past memory you're recalling in as much detail as you can or some hypothetical thing you've never experienced or what you might be doing in the future mm -hmm. um, it turns out that that is very effective for just restoring the capacity to think and plan and motivate for the future but also um, it's incredibly helpful for something that i'm concerned about as a futurist which is helping people overcome normalcy bias. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our brain tends to expect the future to be like today or the past. It's the shortcut we have so that we're not constantly overwhelmed trying to figure out, oh, how do things work? What's true? You know, we, we don't, we don't want to be sense-making all the time. But normalcy bias is dangerous when things actually are changing and we're too slow to notice, we're too slow to react and adapt. It turns out if you vividly imagine a future that's very different, you, you essentially create a memory of that possibility that feels as significant a piece of data to your brain as if it were a real fact, right? Um, so if you vividly imagine having to move due to climate change, right? And so I might ask you to imagine, well, what exact aspect of climate change is leading you to move? Is it that your town keeps flooding? Is it that it's extreme wildfire risk and air pollution all the time? Is it extreme heat? You know, um, how how are you making the decision to move? Who did you have a conversation with? What what did you say? You know, write down the details of that conversation. When you imagine these things that you've never had to live through before vividly, um, then it becomes more plausible, and your brain accepts it as a possible plausible future. And so it's interesting that this, you know, technique developed to just as a, as a cognitive, you know, intervention mm -hmm. to help people with impaired cognitive function, um, has this kind of superpower for preparing for future risks. Is all of these, all these things are sort of feeding on each other it makes me very hopeful, um, and optimistic for how these two fields might continue to create like mutually beneficial strategies and therapies. Absolutely. I mean, I wonder, there's a growing awareness of, you know, climate anxiety, right, as um, among, you know, particularly among adolescents and you know, people who are relatively young. And so, you know, I think 
while there's there are sort of climate aware therapies, there's still this tendency, I think, in therapy to look at, you know, kind of like, oh, how is someone's anxiety <laughs> due to um, sort of um, how how can they interpret things differently to be less anxious or yeah. you know, sort of path almost sort of mm-hmm. you know quite questioning whether someone should be as anxious as they are. And so I mean I kind of wondered in reading about your work whether we should be whether a kind of you know treatment should be instead you know having students engaged in these forecasting games yeah. about the future so that they're really um, engaged constructively and in a way that completely validates the concerns. That's so and, interesting. Um, I'm, and my brain is bubbling over with, with responses to that. So the first thing I want to say is I think you're absolutely right. You know, I've seen more references to righteous anger, you know, that we've had like anger management, you know, classes, anger, th- you know, to try to get people to be less angry. But then we also have this idea of righteous anger. Like what are we justified in feeling anger about? And how can we use that emotion to mm-hmm. demand change, right? To create change. I think we may see in the coming decades, similar to righteous anger, maybe rightful anxiety, you know, instead of trying to cognitively reframe our concerns about climate change or failure to act on climate change. um, Absolutely. You know, could, could therapists, could counselors, could our communities find ways to validate and reflect back the rightfulness um, while also using some of these scenario techniques, imagination techniques, um, to help people move out of a state of just anxiety um, into into feeling ready and feeling um, motivated to make change today, feeling like they are, are they belong to a community that cares as much as they do. It's funny you the one of the big I don't know like the one of the studies that just sticks in my mind. I think about it all the time with so much empathy and compassion for the people in the study. Um, you, you, I think you may even be referring to this study, the um, Lancet Planetary Health Journal that had this landmark study of more than 10,000 young people age uh, was age, is 16 to 25. And they found that two thirds of them reported feeling primarily sad, afraid and anxious about the future. And 56% said they felt that humanity was doomed and they personally had no future. And this is, I mean, this is a mental health crisis that is different from mental health crises we've seen before because they say the number one reason they feel this way is, is anger and confusion over a government's failure to act on climate change. Now. How do we cognitively reframe that? They're not wrong. (laughs) So this is a different kind of mental health crisis. And it's one that we need to meet with tools and strategies for channeling this kind of rightful anxiety into new forms of social action, new forms of political change and political imagination. It's one of the reasons why in my book, I have these three big super scenarios at the end that I want people to spend 10 days journaling from these futures. They're about different topics, but what all three of them have in common is that they imagine incredible, innovative, you know, concerted effort on the part of leaders, you know, communities working together, governments working together effectively to address our issues and trying to, you know, plant seeds in our imagination that we aren't doomed to not act. We aren't, you know, there are ideas, there are pathways to a better future and trying to help people vividly imagine, wait, what is the roadmap? If we're afraid that we haven't acted enough yet, can we imagine what does successful collective action on this issue look like? And I think that, I mean, that's the therapy. The therapy is planning realistic hope, you know, in our minds with vivid possible futures that might actually solve, whether it's, you know, climate, racial injustice, economic inequality, all these things we're trying to heal, um, you know, not trying to, not trying to learn to live with them, but to, um, to channel our anxiety into vividly, you know, plausible, better worlds. Yeah. I mean, you, 
emphasized throughout the book that imagining the future or you know, forecasting interventions is best done with others, right? That this is a social endeavor. And it, you know, because I do think, and there's some research that, you know, for people with anxiety, right? Like there's, there's already a lot of negative thinking about the future, right? And that can be hard to turn off. Um, and so it almost made me think of parallels with like new forms of psychedelic treatment where the medicine isn't just the drug, right? It's like having this guide mm. and a community. Um, and I, you know, I think you are the ultimate guide, right? Because you invented this <laughs> field, but what would you say are the important characteristics in someone who's going to be guiding others through these sort of scenarios? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. So at the Institute for the Future, we actually just opened our first public center for what we call imagination leadership training, which so you can come to the center. Um, it's at urgentoptimists.org and you can learn techniques for leading people to uh, develop a particular mindset with regard to the future that we call urgent optimism. And that's also the framework for my book. So imaginable is divided into three sections that are, um, each section has different mental habits and different games you can play and skills you can develop to build the three different psychological strengths that make up urgent optimism. So they are mental flexibility. So that's, that's the ability to recognize that things can change, right? even things that seem like they were always been true, they'll be true forever, to have the mental flexibility to accept that the future can be different, even things that seem impossible to change today. So mental flexibility, um, then realistic hope, which is a kind of balance of positive and shadow imagination. It's a practice of when you identify something that you feel is a risk or a threat, you balance it by looking for a helper who's somebody who's working on this problem now, what are their ideas or their theories about how to solve the problem. You look for a new policy idea or a social movement or a new technology or scientific breakthrough. So we're, it's a constant practice as you, as you, you know, notice things that could go wrong, you're building your awareness and engagement with things that could go right. And then the third um, psychological strength is, uh, so you would future self-efficacy, future power. It's that really strong rooted sense that there are actions you can take to meaningfully impact how the future turns out. Um, and that too is a practice. It's, um, it's about, trying out different behaviors or technologies or, um, you know, identities that could make you feel more ready for mm. a future, you know, learning a new skill. Um, I always say like, if you're, if you're, if you're worried about a future, um, you know, try to play with it. Is there any way you can, you can touch it today? Right before we came on today, we were talking about climate migration and sort of all the anxiety that produces. And one of the things I tell people is like, you know, just why don't you go look at a map and look at all of the places that scientists believe will be the most climate safe, climate resilient places in the future. Like, take a look at all these places. Um, you know, how many of them could you realistically imagine yourself living if you don't already live there? Um, what would it take to live in some of these places? And, you know, so it's always, always looking for um, information that helps you do something today that could make you, you know, more, more able to handle the demands of the future or to affect change in the future. I, I noticed we're getting audience questions. So oh, we are. Okay. Should... Yeah. Let me take a look. Oh, <laughs> so very um, similar to your question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the one question that came up is, does your work have a connection to clinical use of mind altering drugs to imagine different realities? You know, I mean, not in any direct sense, but what I hear from participants in the longer form simulation, sometimes we run them for just a few days or 10 days. Sometimes we run them for six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks. And at the end of it, you know, people say they feel like they feel like they 
they lived through something and it, it feels like this alternate reality that they visited and it, it does feel like a memory of something real. And so it is, it is a little bit trippy. I even say in the book, I think, you know, this is, this, this might sound a little bit weird, a little bit trippy. Like you're walking around with these future scenarios in your mind and you're projecting them. And it just seems like these reality and the future mingle in your mind. Um, and uh, it is, it is in some ways a little bit mind altering. It's why I say in the book that if you don't think of yourself as a creative person or someone with a, a powerful imagination, like after you participate in one of these games um, or you start practicing the skills in the book, you will definitely be somebody who has a powerful imagination. Um, so it is, it is kind of mind altering in that way. One other question is whether you personally participate in most of the simulations that you run. 100%. Um, I always participate um, because I'm a gamer and I would hate to come play and I like to get the benefits. Um, and I've, you know, I've had a lot of really important insights out of, out of playing um, over, you know, the course of my career. I have moved as a result of one of the simulations. I, I realized that I wanted to um, be uh, in a higher density area, depending like, based on the scenario we were imagining, we were thinking about future energy crises and skyrocketing gas prices. And I realized I wanted to be, um, to just, just in case like live somewhere where I could adapt to that world and it wouldn't be so hard. Um, so I've moved as a result of playing. I have, um, I have start developed new projects that I imagine doing in the future. I imagined, you know, creating a game to help during a pandemic. And, and I was like, well, you know what? That sounds like a fun game anyway. I'm going to build the game. And so um, I like to play these games myself because I do find that they produce really interesting, powerful personal insights that, you know, I want to take advantage of um, too, not just as a like intellectual interest, you know, objective researcher, I, I do kind of get in there myself. <laughs> um, one person would like to know what your favorite games are. Oh, well, like all time, all time favorite game. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I always think it's always, you know, for me, I would say my favorite games are the games that the people I love are playing. So, you know, that has changed throughout my life, you know, World of Warcraft, DDR, um, Mass Effect, you know, my kids have just started playing games. So my favorite games now are the games that light my kids up. So the Japanese cat collecting game, Neko Atsume, my daughters are into now. I'm so happy I can mentor them because I got really good at that game like four years ago. And now I'm like this rock star to them that I can help them with it. I mean, for me, the, I, I like games as a way to connect with other people. Pokemon Go, a billion people have downloaded it. I mean, you can't go wrong having developing something in common, culture in common with a billion people. I mean, there's literally short of maybe some of the biggest religions, nothing else on earth that will connect you with as many people. So I tend to pick my favorite games, not like on aesthetics or like mechanics or narrative. For me, it's, you know, what are people I care about playing or you know, what are lots of people playing so that I can have something in common with people who I might otherwise never meet or not feel like I could have a conversation with, spend time with. So yeah, pr I'm pretty boring in that way. I'm like, play all the, whatever's popular. I'm in it. <laughs> um, I'm a little torn because there are a couple of different directions that I'm, you know, interested in hearing more about um so that you choose i mean or maybe weave them together one is um hearing a little bit more about how you apply ideas around like future selves right and mm -hmm. and you talk about blended empathy which also i i think is is important right um especially in in the, some of the scenarios around climate change where we're imagining hardship endured by other people in, in climate migration. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, then there's the, the welcome party um, s simulation that, you know, is elaborated at the end of your book. And so I, you know, I, um, I think, yeah, I think we yeah. can talk about okay. both of them. I have an okay. idea. Great. I have an okay, idea. Great. So 
Blended empathy, um, to me, this is a really powerful concept when I discovered it. So it's, it's like a combination of the two classic kinds of empathy. There's easy empathy or they call it emotional empathy, right? It's when somebody else is experiencing something and you've experienced it yourself and your, your brain essentially gives you like this quick vicarious burst of remembered feelings. So let's say, you know, you see a kid really excited, like a birthday cake's coming out. Everyone's about to sing to them. You remember what it was like to have a big party and feel excited for the cake and the presents. And you get flooded with these like really nice emotions, or you see someone maybe being bullied and you remember like the shame and your body just floods you with the proper, you know, neurochemicals and emotions. So you can really feel it. And, and that's easy. It's not easy if it's an, if it's a negative emotion, you know, it's in some ways it's hard to feel, but it's easy in the sense that it just comes naturally. You don't have to think about it. Your body just goes there. Um, then there's hard empathy or cognitive empathy where you've never experienced what someone else is experiencing. And you're trying to kind of reason it out rational. Well, what does it feel like to um, be fired, you know, or to lose a job or, um, you know, what, whatever else to have to make this difficult decision. Well, it's a choice I've never had to make. And you're trying to imagine what someone else is going through, but you don't have the lived experience. So it's, it's more of a, like a rational cognitive thing. Um, it turns out, you know, we're not so good at cognitive empathy. Even when we try our best, we uh, studies show we, when we try to describe what we guess someone else is feeling, it's often very different from what the people themselves describe. There's not necessarily a lot of correlation. But one thing that tends to kind of bridge that gap and get us better at, at having, having a meaningful sort of experience of empathy is this blended empathy. And I think you know, what's happening in Ukraine right now is a, is a, is a really good opportunity for, for many people to try this blended empathy. So if you yourself has never been displaced due to war and you're trying to imagine what people in Ukraine are going through, um, what, what, what is not recommended is trying to just imagine what it's like to be in Ukraine and have to leave because maybe you've never been there. So you literally can't visualize it. You don't know what it looks like. You don't, I mean, you can't hear the sounds of it's hard to imagine. So you just slightly translate the scenario into your own life and you make it your own story. So imagine that wherever you live is under attack and you have to flee to a neighboring country. Which country would that be? If you're an American, you're thinking about trying to get into Canada or trying to get into Mexico, right? You make it specific instead of Poland, you know, you're bringing in a place that you might know or that has context in your life. Now you start to be able to imagine it. And now you're imagining your family. What would you pack? What is your, you know, suitcase or bag look like? What, how are you, how are you trying to move? You know, when you put it in your own life where you have access to these vivid details and plausible facts, then you can have an imaginative experience that it may not be exactly what someone else is going through, but it's much more meaningful. People who do this form of blended empathy are more likely to act on behalf of, you know, the other people that they've imagined to advocate for things that benefit this, this other group, um, to feel connected, to feel like they have something in common with them. So this is just like, a, it's an interesting life skill. I think it doesn't have to apply just to imagining the future, although it, it can be helpful. Again, it's this form of imagination training that helps us imagine things that otherwise would be unimaginable, but it's just also, if we're trying to relate to someone else, you know, give ourselves a moment to, to like transmute the details into, into a story that we might have to live through. And then we can think about what we would do, how we would act, how we would help. I mean, it's literally what we do in the future scenarios. It's exactly the same thing. Um, so there's this, there's this interesting kind of like neurological cross training of, of empathy, and future imagination mm -hmm. when you play these games. Mm. Thank you. I think I think it seems like such a such an important kind of direction or a skill for people to learn as they're trying to sympathize with other people or connect with different causes um, to do that in, in a way that has some authenticity and mm. and meaning. Um, 
would you like to try to connect that to the welcome party? Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, you know, one of my, when people ask me, what's, what's the next big future that I want people to imagine and prepare for? Like we were doing pandemic simulations, you know, and, and a lot of the challenges that we anticipated came to pass. So what am I looking at now? Um, and I'm looking at forced migration, um, displacement, um, largely due to climate change. Um, but what we're seeing happen now is like a, it's like a sneak preview, right? So it's, it's the largest um, mass displacement of children since World War II, uh, millions of people being relocated and, and trying to, I mean, like, you know, doubling populations of some cities overnight, right? Um, and so it's kind of like a, a sneak preview of what we might be experiencing experts in climate change anticipate that anywhere from hundreds of millions of people may be forced to move due to extreme weather, extreme heat, sea levels rising, hundreds of millions to um, at the upper end, 3 billion people needing to move as parts of the earth potentially become incompatible with human life, right? That's the technical term they use. Um, so the question, you know, for me is, okay, we have some time, these, these forecasts often look at 10, 20, 30 years out, how could we use this time that we have to prepare to welcome people who need to, if we ourselves are lucky enough to not have to move, um, how can we prepare to be welcoming? How can we stretch our imagination to Think about, you know, this town I live in, what if it were double the population to get comfortable with thinking about these things that, you know, where I live now, they're building more housing because they want denser, you know, housing and low income housing and people are all upset. We can't handle more people. And they're talking about building 700 apartments. We may need to resettle, you know, even in our town, 7,000, 70,000 people. I mean, it's, it's like the magnitude of human movement on the planet is going to be profound as disruptive as the COVID-19 pandemic was, but you know, we have this runway. We can think about what would be a safe and equitable way to move people. What kinds of social support and economic support can we provide? Um, how can we get people somewhere they want to go? Not just wherever they think they can get to, you know, on a boat, you know, illegally smuggling themselves. What, what are safe legal ways we could help people get to where they want to go? And how can we start preparing ourselves for the possible need to migrate, you know, how will we make those decisions? Start having conversations now. I mean, it sounds, in some ways it sounds ridiculous. Like who wants to have a family dinner conversation about, you know, how many, how many extreme heat days are you willing to, to live through before you might want to move? But it, it just, it helps to plant the seeds. It's all about planting seeds so that if you, if you do need to make decisions or you do want to be prepared to welcome, or you don't want to be the person who's stuck in the past and unable to adapt and get with the future, you just have little conversations. If you don't want to talk about it, just imagine it in your mind or keep your journal from the future. Um, this, the scenario is called welcome party because we're just trying to imagine a positive version of this future where we do prepare ourselves to, to embrace you know, and to embrace people and in a way that's sustainable, that sustains their movement, that, it, that it's a positive outcome. Um, and so, you know, trying to, trying to think about this topic in a way where we can feel powerful and helpful and hopeful. Um, that's, that's what the scenario and the, the simulation that I'm inviting people to play in the book uh, is all about. And if people want to um, join with others, I think, is, are there ways for them to do that around that scenario? The yeah. Party? Well, so, um, we, well, I mean, I said, the first thing is, you know, get the book, get, get, get the sort of basic skills, and then you can come and play and practice with us at the Institute for the Future. You can join Urgent Optimist. We're doing a scenario club where we're working through a different scenario from the book each month, and we play with them, and we share our points of view, and we do these live meetups that are like book club, but for scenarios. So um, yes, if you, if you want to participate in a big community, you can come and do that at IFTF. But you know, I'm also getting um, emails now of people who just 
you know, have the book and they're just, they're playing with the scenarios with like their partner, with their spouse, mm -hmm. with, with a sister, with their mom. Um, and that works too. You know, not everybody wants to join a massively multiplayer game, right? You can get the book, you can play on your own. You can play with a, a few friends or with a partner. And, you know, I do think even if you just find one person to imagine the future with, um, that is, that is a great place to start. Great. Well, I want to thank you so much for this conversation um, and for writing this book. I think it's great. So oh, thank, thank you. you. I think, and thanks for going, you know, deep on, on the psychology and the clinical side of it, because that's not something um, I always get to talk about. So I really appreciate that. Great. Great. And on behalf of Town Hall, I just want to th say thank you to both of you for spending um, the evening with us and, and sharing and, and sharing this conversation. Um, and just a reminder to pick up a copy of the book. It sounds like it has lots of really interesting things and also um, is a cool way maybe to engage and interact with the people around you, not just read by yourself, which I love. Um, there's a link in the chat um, for you to pick that up directly from the publisher. So once again, thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.